Um, hello, everyone. We are live again. Uh, in one of the one more talk of the series for the molecular ecology uh, applied to the uh, molecular methods applied to animal ecology course uh, with Dave Hempersh Bennett, Dr. Dave Hempersh Bennett uh, from University of Oxford. Uh, Dave first began using DNA metabar coding in his PhD at Queen Mary University of London, applying the technique to the guano of insectivorous bats from Southeast Asia to analyze how selective logging altered the ecological networks of them and their prey. He now works as a postdoctoral uh, research assistant at the University of Oxford, uh, using this technique to <coughs> study the trophic networks of malaria mosquito species, Anopheles gambi, uh, and predict the effects of reducing their abundances in West Africa. So with you, Dr. Dave Hepburn Bennett, talking about using DNA metabolic coding to study dietary interactions. Hi, thanks Hanani for the introduction and thank you for inviting me and to everyone who's watching. So today I'll give a bit of a talk about some of the work that I've been use doing using DNA metabarcoding and some of the exciting frontiers that it will be opening up for us in ecological study. So here's me holding a bat, that's the tax that I typically study back before the pandemic, before I had to go a year with, without going to a barber's. Then, so I thought it would be uh, nice to begin with but just going sort of back on how I actually got into uh, studying this subject area. So I owe a lot to South America. I did my undergraduate dissertation on the feeding ecology of Peruvian caiman, which meant that I was lucky enough to spend six weeks out in the Peru Peruvian Amazon studying the common caiman and black caiman looking at their diet, which was a really interesting uh, su subject area, really interesting animals to study. However, it meant that most of my data was got by dissecting caiman vomit, which is not the best in terms of data resolution. You sort of pick out that, oh, I've got a fish scale here, oh, I've got the eye of a mammal here, or that sort of stuff. You don't really get that good data resolution. It sort of set my interest in wanting to do dietary study, looking at uh, feeding ecology of animals. But I was thinking that hopefully better techniques would come along so we'd be able to look at feeding ecology using getting better data from it. It's difficult to say if sifting through caiman vomit manually or optimizing PCRs is more painful, but they, I would say that it's at least allowed me to have some slightly more detailed data. So after doing that, I uh, started thinking about using DNA and uh, DNA barcoding to look at uh, ecological phenomena. So that this was where it had been going on for a while, but we were starting to get some actually like really interesting ecological and conservation based studies. So I did some work looking at the link between uh, intestinal parasite load and inbreeding in bumblebees. So I was a field assistant for a PhD student on that project. That got me really interested then in, okay, we could do some cool work with this. I'd like to learn these skills more. So having learned, done a um, conservation degree, I didn't have that many skills in it. So I decided to get some molecular ecology experience. And I did that through looking at the intracellular endosymbiotic bacteria that uh, live within pyrosomes. So pyrosomes being these giant uh, plankton that you see here on the right. Sadly, that's not me diving on one, but they grow up to enormous lengths and bioluminesce to communicate within the many individual clones that make up what you see there. So this got me doing sort of the stuff which is now pretty common in sort of a lot of more molecular biological uh, degrees, sort of DNA extractions, PCR sequencing, etc. And this led for a, a little while into uh, doing some work on bats, no longer looking at their diet. We were looking at uh, how uh, they use churches in the UK, so looking at uh, what the uh, alternate roosts available to them were and what could be uh, potential ways of mitigating some of the damage that they're doing to these historic sites. And that, that then took place using um, radio tracking before I then kind of combined lots of those different things together to then look at actually the feeding ecology of bats, which was what I did in my PhD. So that will make up a lot of what I'm uh, talking about today, uh, the research that I did there. I'll also go a little bit into sort of the current and future work that's taking place. So the PhD research was mostly looking at bats in Borneo and their dietary responses to deforestation, and then also looking a little bit at actually how 
we analyze this data and how the assumptions that go into our analyses can affect the conclusions that we draw there. And then I'll go, yeah, talk about some of the current stuff, which I'll give a little bit more in a minute. So I was working out in Borneo for about a year of my PhD. Uh, it's this uh, island pointed to by the arrow there. I was curious just before this talk to see Southeast Asia, as with South America, is a biodiversity hotspot. I was curious what the size of Borneo is compared to Brazil. You can see it's teeny tiny in comparison. But uh, I was working there as it's a very interesting area and also for a lot of conservation reasons, it's quite an important area to be working in. So it's got huge biodiversity uh, but because of numerous factors, for one being the repeated glaciation and then interglacial periods, meaning that it's been sort of joined to the mainland, joined to other islands, but then separated and this happening in successive rounds. There's been, yeah, huge numbers of um, species have evolved sort of in allopatry and sympatry occurring there. So as sort of a symbol, a sim single example, uh, there's an area of Sarawak, which is uh, this part here, which was measured. It's about 52 football pitches. And for trees, there were 1,175 tree species that were counted. There's 32 tree species in the UK where I'm from. So it's quite interesting for uh, any sort of aspiring ecologist. So some of the work that I did was uh, in these glorious, pristine areas of rainforest. Uh, it's am among other things home to a uh, 100 meter tall tropical tree, the uh, tallest tropical tree in the world. A friend of mine measured it, climbed up to the top with a tape measure. And in sort of the 1950s or so, it was largely untouched. So you had all of this pristine old growth rainforest in large areas, which had sort of phenomenal biodiversity. However, now we live in 2021, there are, is of course a lot more pressures on our planet. So the people in the area need, need uh, money, they need uh, to be producing things from the land. So one of the things that's occurred is lots of selective logging. So this is a more typical uh, photo of the area out there now. So you've got a logging truck going through, you have oil palm plantations down here, and you can see lots of fairly scrappy forest that has been logged at some point. So all of the big trees have been taken out. This is typically selective logging. They'll go in, cut down the biggest uh, trees, which can be sold for the highest price, leave the rest, but cause significant disruption to the trees that are remaining there. And then some of this log forest may then be converted for agriculture. And then with this, uh, yeah, Borneo has lost a lot of its forest cover since then, and a lot of what remains is classed as degraded or seriously degraded. However, as conservationists and ecologists, we need to do more than simply getting upset that, oh, we wish that the old growth forest still remained. This is very sad. We need to actually understand the value of what remains. And so there's a lot of study taking place now into how the ecology, how the um, species that are persisting in there are surviving still. So we know that actually quite a lot of species do persist there. How are they sort of more vulnerable to things in the future? Is this sort of quality useful habitat or are they hanging on by a thread? And this is especially important because a lot of the remaining forest is a uh, production forest. So it's within logging concessions. So if we can actually make recommendations on how to use this area, which will be uh, used for uh, logging in some way, perhaps in uh, rounds of logging in future, then we can have some better conservation go conservation actions. And yet this is also taking place with uh, the big uh, topic for environmentalists or one of the big topics that environmentalists get very concerned about in Southeast Asia is oil palm, with the bulk of it originating in Malaysia and Indonesia, which make up two of the three countries in Borneo where it was working. And some people uh, want to boycott oil palm. They think that uh, the only way is to completely stop using the crop. However, it's an order of magnitude more productive than the next most productive uh, oil producing crop. So if we are trying to feed 7 billion people on this planet, we are going to be needing to be providing, producing oil in some way. 
And so you can get into a lot of arguments about the merits of land sharing versus land sparing for um, uh, the choice between crops that we're using, but it, this clearly has to be part of the solution when we are feeding the world. And it provides a lot of money and employment to the re region. And with this uh, bats being my area of a special interest, there's huge biodiver, huge diversity of bats that are persisting in these areas of forest. We don't know sort of how many of them are strictly reliant on perhaps say old growth areas, but we know that there are 100 species that have been identified within Borneo, which for a teeny island is a huge number. There's probably quite a few more that are left to be discovered. We know that there are some shifts. So in logged forest, you get a lower abundance of bats, possibly because there's a lower number of roost sites if they're roosting in old dead trees or uh, old large trees. And these have been knocked down or uh, cut down in the logging cycles. There's perhaps less roosting uh, sites there, but we still actually get quite a lot of bats within there. So it's there is a change in the assemblage, but it's not actually that. It's not sort of, extremely catastrophic. So we want to, with this, actually understand the longevity of the bats that actually do persist, which brings us on to, among the many things that you could look at there, ecological interactions. So it's one thing to know that bats are persisting in logged forests, but actually how how long do you, are they going to be there? How sort of well are they hanging on in this environment? So. I think from the previous lectures in this series, you'll have heard a little bit about ecological networks. So I won't go into huge detail on what we're looking at here, but we have essentially bat species are the rectangles along the top, and then uh, prey species being the rectangles along the, along the bottom. And the bars going between them are interactions where a bat is feeding on multiple prey or feeding on that uh, individual prey. So we wanted to test a, a few things with uh, the, this technique. So I'll go into just a couple of them here for you today. So firstly, that bats have a smaller prey base in the log forest than in the primary forest. And if they did have a lower base of prey in uh, log forest, this probably means that they're a bit more vulnerable to future environmental perturbations. So if you feed on, say, 100 species and a few of them go extinct because of some stochastic variation in the environment or some anthropogenic stress, you're not likely to be so severely affected as if you actually only feed on, say, 10 species or five species, then any fluctuations in the numbers or extinction of those species is going to be a bigger problem for you. And with this, we hypothesize that the taxonomic composition of the prey consumed by the bats uh, changes across forest types. And a bit of a vague uh, statement for the final one, but predator to prey networks are measurably different in log forest and primary forest. So when we're making these ecological networks, we can actually see measurable distance differences in attributes of the network, which are associated with longevity and stability. I have to say here that uh, this sort of work is generally done, takes place with a team and I was very lucky to work closely with Victoria Kemp and Joshua Blackman, Tor holding a tiny Caravula uh, intermedia there and Josh holding some Nycteris species. Uh, we worked very closely throughout the 10 or 11 months that we were in the jungle. And then this would also took place with um, a team of local research assistants who was uh, on a rotor going out into the forest with us, helping us with our traps and the um, various other elements of the study. This took place out in northern Borneo, so showed you the map of where it is in um, Southeast Asia before, so we were in the state of Sabah, where we had four study sites, which were two old growth uh, rainforest sites which have been basically untouched by logging, Malayal Basin and Danum Valley, and then the SAFE project and Sabah Biodiversity Experiment which have been uh, experimentally logged so we can then look at how various stuff differs between the logged forest and the old growth forest. So over 876 harp trap nights we caught over 3,000 bats of yeah, over 40 species and from all of those we got lots of fecal samples which I then uh, sequenced and I'll tell you a little bit more about later. 
To give a bit of background on the field work, so it was using these things called harp traps. So they are, yeah, uh, large traps, which you can't really see here. Uh, they have parallel rows of fishing line going from top to bottom. So these uh, banks of fishing line kind of look a little bit like a harp, a musical instrument. And that's for reasons we don't entirely understand. They uh, either try and dodge the fishing line, but then uh, don't succeed or don't notice that it's there because we've put it up on a commuting route, route where when you're commuting, you're probably not paying quite as much attention to your surroundings as you might otherwise be, so you're more likely to bumble into something. They fly into the uh, a row of fishing line, fall uh, down into the uh, bag at the bottom, and then they remain there unharmed until we come along and then check the trap later. Um, being in tropical rainforest, we've got some umbrellas which we've cable tied to the top because it rains a lot. For every minute of animal handling, there was probably about 20 more of lugging heavy equipment up and down steep hills, but it was great for being able to work out there and see the incredible wildlife that we did. So we caught lots of bats a little bit like this. This is actually an uh, unusual one for the bat nerds in there. It was, uh, it's Rhinolophus francisi, and I believe it was the seventh record uh, of this bat species in the world. And this was actually to drive home the point that log forest is thought to be really quite uh, useful still for conservation. We caught this really rare unknown bat in a fairly scrappy area of forest near our camp that had been logged multiple times. And then uh, we would catch the bats, put them in a bag for a little bit, release them, and quite often they were so distracted by things such as biting the bags that we put them in that you'd be able to hang them up from a tree and uh, have them just chewing away on the bag that we had had them in for there but the important thing was when we had left them in the bag about 40 percent of the bats that we caught left a poo in the bottom of it so this this was how we obtained our samples so you catch lots of bats leave them in bags for a while and then hopefully you've got a poo at the end of it Then, so I think you've been spoken to by some people that have done DNA meta barcoding before, but basically we would uh, extract the DNA from the bat, from the um, bat feces, amplify it using some arthropod specific primers, so primers which would only amplify arthropod DNA and not vertebrate DNA, such as the bat. So we're then able to get sequences of what the bat has consumed. This is done using high throughput sequencing, so in this case it was an Illumina MySeq, which has the advantage that it gives you tons of data, however some of it's rubbish uh, is the sort of the trade-off for it. So firstly you have to go through some quality control steps, binning some, some of the data that uh, it doesn't quite meet your thresholds, and then you're left with lots and lots of these A's, G's, C's and T's in long sequences, in this case of about 157 base pairs, and you then want to try and do some sort of ecology with them. Now, when you're doing studies in areas where there's relatively low levels of biodiversity, and especially areas where there's been a lot of study taking place, you might be able to then match those sequences to the species that uh, gave that sequence, so this would be the species that the bat had consumed. However, when you're working in areas such as Borneo, there's tons of species that uh, it could potentially be, and there's a very low level of reference databases available for, there's a very low, low level of sequences available in the reference databases. So we're not really able to do that much in the way of taxonomic assignment to the sequences that we get back. So we have all of these unique sequences we want to try and make them into some sort of ecologically meaningful unit. So what we did in, in this case and what's typically done is clustering them together into operational taxonomic units, typically by some threshold of sequence similarity. So you say if, for example, two sequences are 95% similar, okay, for purposes of this study, we will say that they are therefore the same thing, so we'll clump them together. Whereas these two sequences, they were actually less than 92 uh, what did I say? 92% similar, so they will then be uh, multiple sequences instead. So we will then convert them into nodes for our ecological study. So by doing this to the sequences that we've obtained, we then 
create the nodes in our food web. So we know the species of the bats that we caught because we already have the, uh, we had the bats in the hand and we were able to identify them. But then for this sort of example graphic, each of these would be an operational taxonomic unit where we've said that by, the, by our clustering criteria, each of these, uh, each of these down at the bottom are OTUs. They are sort of pseudo species which the bats consumed that are similar enough that we consider them to be the same thing. And then you can start to actually do your ecological study where you're looking at, say, dietary overlap and ecological network structure based on the bats and their prey that we've now converted into OTUs. So to remind you of the hypotheses that we were testing, uh, we were looking to see if bats had a smaller prey base in the log forest than in the primary forest, that the uh, predator prey networks were measurably different in the log forest and the primary forest, and that the taxonomic composition of prey changed across forest type. Jump in quickly with something else though, which is possibly not especially organized. We had um, two pest species that popped up within these bats that we had caught within the forest. So these are known to be, uh, these moths are known to be pests in agricultural areas. Some of these uh, bats were caught near agricultural areas. So it's interesting that we were actually in the few species that we were able to assign taxonomic status to with pest species typically being ones which have had more attention than sort of more ecologically obscure moths. We were able to say these bats did consume low levels of Silogap, Gramma, Menephron and Pleuroptia, Balteata. But to get back to the hypotheses there, so that bats have a smaller prey base in log forest than in primary forest, we can see here that that is true. So we have smoothed histograms uh, where we have primary rainforest as the two top sites and then a log rainforest site as the bottom and the bat species across the top here. And essentially the uh, further the smooth histogram is skewing to the right, the greater the number of prey OTUs, so these pseudo species that we're looking at in this case, that were consumed by any individual bat that we caught there. You can see for the log, uh, primary rainforest sites, it was skewed further to the right, so they were consuming a greater number of prey OTUs in primary areas than they were in the log forest site. Now, for today, I'll just talk about one measure of um, ecological networks. Uh, I was, one of the hypotheses was that we would see meaningful uh, differences between the networks that we looked at. So this is one called nestedness, which is a bit wordy to describe, but basically the Echo, the interactions of the specialists within a system are subsets of the interactions of the generalists. So we see here that fly species I only uh, pollinates flower species E, but every other species within there also pollinates uh, flower species E. So the interactions of the specialist, the fly, are a subset of the interactions of all of the generalists that occurred within this system. Now this abstract concept can be quite important for ecological network research because we know that a highly nested network, there is more redundancy in it. So if a, a species within there were to go extinct, there would be lower implications for the rest of the network because the functions that that species did would be uh, would still be performed presumably by the other species within there. So this, as a highly nested network, would have a very high value of nestedness. Then for our actual uh, data that we collected out in Borneo, we can see that this hypothesis holds true. So there is a considerable difference between the two primary rainforest sites, but both of them are considerably more nested than the logged rainforest site. So at the logged rainforest site, there is a lower interaction redundancy than there is in the primary. This could mean that in future, if there was, were stresses on the environment, say one of the big ones being climate change, uh, if that caused uh, some small scale species extinctions, you would expect there to be greater implications for the bats and their prey as a system because of the lo lower nestedness value. Then there was a whole load of stuff that we were able to test specifically with this one species, which 
I hated at first. They were extremely uh, annoying animals to work with. They're particularly feisty and bitey. Also, you can see there that we're holding gloves for um, for our safety whenever we're handling the bats. These ones would be yeah getting quite cross with you and trying to nibble on you the entire time. But then we caught lots and lots of them. And so that gave actually really quite good statistical power to test some uh, of these questions for a single species. So whereas if we got lower numbers of one bat species, then we had infer less about them with this species where we got lots, we were able to really look in greater detail at uh, their feeding ecology. So before I populate the data that uh, goes into this plot, so I'll just explain. So there were uh, four sites for this analysis. Uh, Danum and Maliao, the top two, being um, old growth rainforest sites, primary rainforest sites, and then safe and Sabah biodiversity experiment being logged. And then going across the uh, x-axis, so we have the different prey tax that are consumed by those bats. And then the darker the rectangle that will be popping up in a second, that will be the greater the proportion of individuals that we caught that consumed that order of prey. Then we see in the taxa that are consumed by the bats, there's not a huge amount of difference between the different sites. There are some differences, as you would expect. I think a lot of that is just stochastic. Um, unsurprisingly, the bats were consuming a lot of Diptera and Lepidoptera. Interestingly uh, to me, they were also consuming a lot of Blatodia, which are the termites and cockroaches. But see, so while we see patterns of them consuming much more um, of a, some taxonomic orders than they are of others, actually the difference between the different sites and between the different logging treatments is not really anything that much. We see this again when we break down the data a little bit more. So when doing, looking at uh, non-metric multi-dimensional scaling ordinations, we have here uh, three sites which we visited over three years. Uh, well, SAFE was the one that was visited over three years and Danima Malia were visited in 2016 and 2017. We're looking first of all to see if there is any difference in their prey consumption at order level between uh, from one year to another. Not really. They're, pretty similar altogether. There's pretty much entirely overlap between from one year to another. So we can see that their prey consumption at the order level is reasonably stable. Then if for one year where we uh, sampled all four of the sites in fairly quick succession, we can see that, again, there's pretty much entire overlap between the sites other than a couple of them outliers there. So we don't see any real evidence that one site or another has different prey bases that are being consumed by the bats. And finally, uh, for a few of the sites looking at um, the number of bats that we had of the species Hippocidrus sabinus and the OTU diversity, uh, you can see that while we sampled lots of bats, we sequenced lots of bats within this, we're nowhere near reaching an asymptote in the accumulation of prey OTUs that were actually consumed by the bats. So it looks like you would need to fully characterize their diet at any given site or even across the entire uh, country, you'd need to put in a phenomenal amount of sampling effort. And that makes sense really, because they are generalist species. That's a thought to be sort of generalist foragers, mostly feeding on whatever's in front of them. And given that it's tropical rainforest, there is a ma massive diversity of prey that, that is in front of them for them to consume. So to summarize for that part of the talk, so the prey diversity that they consume is extremely high, as you'd expect. Uh, they have broader diets in terms of the number of OTUs consumed in log for forest, in uh, primary forest than they do in the log forest. And the taxonomic composition of the, their diet doesn't change between forest sites or indeed the logging treatments. And so this is where I have to plug. So one of the uh, papers that's um, coming out of that is now as a preprint that's up on BioArchive. Hopefully it will, uh, the gods of peer review will smile on it soon and it will be out, out and able to be read. Then there's a second preprint that will be coming out some point in the next few months. So the one on Hypsidrus Savinus. And in terms of what we've learned from this, so we, we already knew that uh, log forest is correlated with lower abundance of roost sites and uh, bat abundance and some slight shifts in the uh, bat community there. 
We now also know that there is a reduced dietary richness uh, of the bats and altered network structure within the log forest sites that remain. So this means while log forest areas take up a uh, make up quite a large amount of the habitat that remains for them and is still viable habitat for them, we need to be conscious of the fact that this habitat is perhaps a little bit more brittle, there's less redundancy in the system than you would have in old growth areas. And so when making conservation decisions going forward, we need to understand that this is valuable and also perhaps also to sort of be handled with care. And then uh, for, for the next aspect of it, so another uh, piece of work that came out of the PhD working with Hanani was looking at how taxonomic resolution affected network structure. So this came out last year in ecology and we were interested mostly from a molecular angle, but there was actually also a lot of um, parallels uh, for more general sort of observational ecology. And I mentioned earlier that we have these pools of genetic diversity that we use at, sort of in place of taxonomic species and in place of Linnaean species when we're doing ecology using DNA metabarcoding. So we put them into uh, operational taxonomic units and uh, it allows us to study communities where we can't really identify some or all of the species that were within there. So we can say, okay, we don't really know what you are, but all five of these sequences are so similar to one another that we would think that they are probably the same taxonomic unit. And this is done by the haplotype similarity, so the similarity of the individual sequences that we get back. Now, clustering together lots of different uh, unique items based on uh, some sort of level of similarity isn't just restricted to uh, molecular ecology. So I was trying to find uh, tutorials on how to do various ordinations based on similarities a while ago. And here, based on, I believe, uh, violent crime rates and genres, we have uh, all of the um, states in the uh, USA clustered together by similarity. So put into two dimensions and then uh, using an arbitrary threshold uh, clustered together. And so we can see they make up three fairly uh, distinct clusters of their crime profiles. However, if we adjust the parameter somewhat, we can see that oh, actually maybe they, it makes up four different uh, clusters instead. And then if we tweak the parameter slightly further, perhaps uh, it could be five. And then if we go and increase our clustering threshold even further to having six different clusters, that doesn't look reasonable anymore. So we can use these sorts of tools to cluster together all sorts of different things. However, um, while we are doing um, this for sequencing data, it's not sort of a low number of things where you can sort of visually look at it and sort of validate stuff manually. It's instead dealing with probably millions of unique sequences. And so we need to uh, have some sort of rules of thumb that we use to um, test sort of what is and isn't acceptable. And a lot of the work that had taken, had and has taken place uh, in species interactions uses uh, MOTU clustering thresholds. So in that previous example, I was setting an arbitrary threshold of similarity to uh, have things sort of put together into one unit or put into multiple ones. And the threshold that you use there, it can be a bit arbitrary. And uh, I was curious what the impact of this would actually be. So sort of a lot of people's working hypothesis was, okay, if we say that we're using a similarity threshold to cluster things together into one operational taxonomic unit of say 92% similarity or 96% similarity, it's probably not going to change things that much because while you're affecting the data a little bit, when you're generating your ecological units, you're affecting every sample the exact same way. So it's probably not going to be causing much many differences overall. But I didn't know how well I really trusted that that would hold up. So we know, for example, that um, 
different uh, taxonomic groups say have um different variation in the similarity within and between species so it could be plucking uh toy examples out of the air that you have greater levels of genetic similarity within a species in the lepidoptera than you do in the diptera or vice versa and so if you're not uh, doing any sort of taxonomic assignments you won't, won't really know that you're changing the species diversity of if one pool of spe if one site had much more lepidoptera and one site had much more diptera then using a coarse or a fine level of similarity could change actually the conclusions that you're drawing within there. It also has the uh, slight issue that we're collapsing down tro uh, multiple trophic levels. We don't really, it's purely looking at bipartite interactions in this case. So you could could have bats, some of which are feeding on uh, caterpillars, some of which are feeding on uh, wasps, and we're losing that sort of within uh, prey difference in anything. And then there could be other uh, le levels of diversity that are relevant to the study, such as um, the gen genetic diversity within species that's being consumed that we'll be losing as well. So I was curious to look at more detail into some of this. So we've been looking at some ecological interaction networks so far. So as an example for how this could uh, possibly be changing things, so I've got a little example here. So we have two uh, predators at the top and What's actually happening in nature is that they are consuming three prey species at the bottom. And in this uh, top left, this is the actual interactions as they are occurring in the wild and the different scenarios that we could be potentially drawing based on chain, based on our uh, differences in bioinformatic parameters. So a best case scenario is, okay, actually we generate data which is identical to what's going on in the natural world. However, if we alter our parameters a little bit and um, don't quite manage to approximate it correctly, it could be that the yellow node from the um, actual interactions that are occurring, we, because of the way that we've uh, drawn up our data, it gets split into multiple things. And so suddenly we've gone from a case of niche overlap to there being uh, predators which are consuming discrete diets. And or alternatively, when we're clustering our sequences into multiple uh, taxonomic units, it could be that we've gone the other way and actually made it so that what is in reality one species is showing up in our data as multiple taxonomic units. And so they are, though in reality just one taxa, they are being analysed as if it's two. So I hypothesized with that that the clustering levels that you use would be strongly affecting the structure of the uh, networks that you measure, and that but that there would be common patterns to the impact that they're having on networks. So if we were comparing uh, two ecological networks at um, different clustering thresholds in generating them, you would have uh, the same findings, uh, no matter if you're using, say, 92% similarity to cluster the sequences or 98% clip similarity. Uh, you would still get the same conclusion of which network had, say, the bigger ne ecological network value that we're measuring. And then it was pointed out that this actually mirrors some of the uh, issues that we have in observational networks. So it's not an issue that's just restricted to molecular, eco uh, molecular ecology, though that's where most of my background is. It was also, um, it's possible that you're getting similar stuff in networks where people are able to identify, say, some of their tax, the taxa that are occurring in this site to species, but it might be that some of them are actually cryptic, uh, so they are only able to get them, to say, genera, or perhaps you've got in an ecological network uh, nodes which you might even only get to order or something. So it took this analysis took place uh, in two uh, different chunks. So a lot of it was molecular. So we generated seven ecological networks using a range of the uh, clustering thresholds that I was talking about. And then we measured the um, a set of focal ecological network uh, metri metrics for each data set. And then we compared the rank order of these to see if changing the clustering threshold of a network that was used to generate a network would be changing the conclusions that you would draw as an ecologist analyzing that data. Then we have 
a lot going on in this slide, I'm afraid, but we have six different ecological network metrics that we're looking at. So each of these graphs it, um, within here is a different metric. And then the colored uh, dots and the lines of best fit going through them are the uh, seven different data sets that we were analyzing. You can see here for some metrics, while um, going from a low clustering threshold to a high one, say from 91 to 98%, there is little change in the um, conclusions that you'd be drawing. For some of the metrics, actually, it's all over the place. So if we look at modularity, uh, you would get completely different conclusions of which was the most modular network if you're using 91% similarity to cluster your sequences into nodes than you would if you were looking at 98% similarity. But looking at a slightly more uh, relaxed comparison, so it's a subset of the seven networks that we had in the previous slide, these were two data, two networks that um, Hanani had generated based on data from um, Costa Rica. And we see that when you're not throwing quite so many data sets and when it's sort of ecologically matched data sets into a comparison, we were still seeing more reasonable differences there. And so changing um, parameters when generating data didn't have quite such an extreme effect. And then I haven't given too much emphasis to this because uh, it's, this is a much more um, molecular based talk than uh, sort of visual ecology. But we did some similar analyses based on plants and seed consumers, uh, which, were, which were networks that I um, managed to find online, which uh, open data sets where there were full species level resolution for both the plants and the seeds that consumed them. And we were looking at if you coarsely I sort of misidentified or identified your course level the species that uh, made up the networks do your conclusions change so if rather than identifying all of your species to um, species level you're instead getting them to genus family or order uh, as you see here do you uh, is it possible for your conclusions when comparing networks to change we found that if you're able to identify lots of your nodes just to genus rather than species, that's not really too bad for the comparative ecology. However, when you start to get, say, to family or order level, then you can, you're much more likely to be seeing big uh, changes in your conclusions that you're drawing. And then this varies a little bit depending on which ecological network metric you're analyzing. So to yeah, summarize on that, the resolution that you're using actually to generate your data set can have a pretty strong effect on um, what you're me measuring in your data. So it's a fairly common sort of scientific uh, issue that what you do to your data affects your data and therefore what it tells you. And so it's really highlighting that it's something that has to be considered, especially with uh, these new uh, technologies such as uh, meta barcoding where it's you can generate fantastic amounts of data, but you need to really interrogate how robust the conclusions that you're drawing from it are. Then the metrics that were used, so there are lots of different ecological network metrics you can use to uh, quantify different aspects of your data sets. Some of them were more prone to uh, shifting the rank order of the data sets, and so giving different conclusions than uh, than others. And so some of that in, is probably indicating changes in the actual underlying data, and some of it is probably indicating that uh, a metric isn't that, is a bit oversensitive to this sort of slightly arbitrary nature of the data where you're deciding how to carve all of your sequences into discrete taxonomic groups. And yeah, with a lot of this, you, there is the um, slight issue that you're generating huge amounts of data and some of the absolute values that you're going to be calculating can be a little bit arbitrary because some of the ways that we handle data as scientists are a little arbitrary. So you're never going to be getting exactly what the ecological truth is within your um, study, but you're, what you want to be doing is if you're comparing multiple data sets, looking for things which one sort of, may one 
if you're drawing a conclusion from, on how lots of different, on how a few different sites, for example, differ, it's more about the effect size than if there is a difference between the two sites. And so if one has a much greater value than the other, that's probably a bit more robust than if they are seeming fairly similar, but there's a little bit of a difference. So it's, uh, yeah, looking at how big differences are rather than the presence or absence of differences between data sets. And then as with uh, data, data that's generated in more traditional observation manners, standardizing things such as taxonomic resolution, so standardizing what you do to one data set, you should also be doing to another, um, really holding truth. And with that, acknowledging that your data is never going to be perfect. There are always going to be text technological limitations within what you're uh, st studying and analyzing. And to finish up, I yeah thought I would um, talk a little bit about, so that was work that I had done uh, during my PhD at Queen Mary. I'm now uh, doing a postdoc at the University of Oxford. I'm doing it with uh, a nonprofit called Target Malaria. Now, Target Malaria are a, a group who aim to end malaria through using genetically mo modified mosquitoes with gene drive technology. Uh, I'm sort of the wrong type of molecular biologist to really be going into very much detail on how they would be doing that. If anyone's curious, and I think it's fascinating, the uh, resources on their website are fantastic. And so rather than developing the technologies for how to do that, using my background in using uh, meta barcoding to look at ecological interactions. I'm in a team that are trying to look at what the effects would actually be of if we were successful in eradicating or seriously reducing Anopheles gambiae. So uh, just to point at where I am on a map here, so we are working in Ghana uh, at these two sites in the east uh, southeast in the Volta region. And having gone from tropical rainforest, we're now working in more sort of uh, savanna and um, village type habitats. So Anopheles gambiae, one of the reasons that uh, it is such a pest for a disease burden is that it's very strongly associated with villages. And so if you're wanting to look at the potential role of a species within it, its system, you need to be getting the typical environment. So we're looking at it in villages looking at the uh, trophic ecology of them. And this is early enough uh, within my postdoc and also with issues with COVID sort of pausing a lot of our work that I don't have any data yet to report on it, but we're hoping to have this highly uh, simplified picture in a much more realistic in a much more fleshed out way. So we have lots of different uh, species, different taxonomic groups that could be preying on uh, Anopheles gambiae and other similar species such as, you know, uh, bumblebees or uh, flies, species which um, we also don't know that much about the ecology of. And then these are all uh, having their own species interactions in turn, so perhaps as pollinators or in a larval form feeding on things such as algae, etc. And we're trying to generate a large data set based on um, the sequences that we can get from predator guano or regurgitates, or in case of invertebrate predators, uh, gut contents, and then also pollen grains. And with this, we'll create a enormous ecological network where we can then try and predict from this what would happen if we removed the Anopheles gambio from the network? It seems likely that there won't be a huge effect of all of this, but we are going to sort of look at not only the interactions of Anopheles gambio, but what uh, their predators or what their, what their predators also consume and what their pollinators also consume. We can then start to see any redundancy within the system we know that Anopheles gambiae are a very low percentage of the biomass in these villages and also being an equatorial damp climate, it's very biodiverse. So we anticipate that there will be uh, low effects on their networks, but we will be yeah, modeling the effects on their data in much greater detail than previously been possible.
And so we're doing this through predominantly DNA metabarcoding, but because we've got a species that we're especially interested in and metabarcoding, it's a bit stochastic. You get hopefully most of what a predator has consumed, but you don't necessarily get all of it. We'll also be using qPCR uh, for insectivory samples. So using, uh, trying to actually amplify specifically just Anopheles gambier sequences from uh, predator dietary samples so you can have a true presence or absence of that species in a sample as well as knowing if you've got it in your metabarcoding data or not. If you've got a band for the Anopheles gambier short sequence then you know uh, that it was in a predator and if you don't get that it seems likely that it probably wasn't. And then a little aside um, while waiting for data for that to come through, we've done a bit of work on uh, spiders in the UK to try and test some of our assumptions going into that. So we have from diff underneath different street light treatments, uh, we have spiders that were collected and we wanted to see how uh, their feeding ecology differs underneath in two different months. So this being in the UK, February is very cold and April is a little bit less cold. And then we wanted to see how using different PCR primers affected the prey that we detect within them. And then because this is a study that took place actually within the UK, for once in my career as a tropical biologist, we had reasonably good reference libraries that you can compare the sequences you get back. So we can look at how representative uh, the data it is when you're assigning it to species if you're instead assigning it to something such as OTUs. In this case, I was curious, not using operational taxonomic units as they were previously uh, described in this talk, I was looking at uh, approximate sequence variants, which are basically where using the sequencing error profile when you're generating your data, uh, you start to clump things together only on if it looks like they're unique haplotypes. So if there was a G at uh, one point for one sequence, but a C at another, but you know that there was quite a lot of errors in that region of those two sequences, then we say they're probably the same speed, they're the same sequence, in fact. So these are networks not of um, multiple sequences clumped together in the same way, but instead being uh, assigned pretty much based just on sequencing error. And then, so it was looking at two different uh, PCR primers, and this is just the number of unique uh, approximate sequence variants that were detected for each um, taxonomic order within um, the samples. You see that with uh, one primer pair, ZBJ, which is one which is um, controversial within the metabarcoding literature, but it's the one that we used for um, a lot of the work that I talked about earlier, you do get a broader taxonomic range of the uh, prey than we were getting within the ANML ones. So when trying to choose uh, primers for future work, it's interesting to know that actually we're probably getting a broader set of stuff with the ZBJ primers than with the ANML ones. And then because we were able to actually assign a lot of these sequences to species level, um, we, I was then able to look at with either with them, the sequences that are returned from the guts of these spiders that we sequenced, uh, which species were detected in a given spider, either only by the ANML ones, so this heat map, a brighter colour is that um, many more, a bright colour is that more species were only detected from that order with that primer pair. Uh, and if it's in both, then in a given sample, that species was actually detected by both primer pairs. We can see that, perhaps unsurprisingly, the highest number of species that were being detected by both uh, were the Aranea, the spiders. So because we were using arthropod-specific primers in this case, a lot of what we're uh, getting is the spider itself rather than the prey that's within its guts. And so that's kind of... Um, that's skewing the uh, chart slightly. So if we remove the RNA, then we get a slightly more detailed picture where we see that the ZBJ primers, they've previously been stated that they are 
prefer they preferentially amplify diptera and lepidoptera. It does seem in this case that actually there were quite a few uh, species that we found within our diet that were only amplified by diptera or lepidoptera. Uh, there were, um, sorry, it's quite late in the afternoon for me now. There were um, quite a few species that, of the diptera and the lepidoptera that were only detected by ZBJ. And then out of curiosity, I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to think that there's a one-to-one -one relationship on uh, between approximate sequence variance and species. We know that a species will have a reasonable amount of variation between uh, the <coughs> uh, within the barcoding gene that we're using. It's curious to see from two different primer sets how uh, the number of species detected in a consumer correlated with the number of ASVs that were detected in a consumer. And you can see that actually it's a surprisingly good relationship, although I'd caution that this is quite a low sample size that went into this, so I shouldn't read too far into it. Then actually for the uh, ecological side of things, so looking underneath different uh, types of street lighting, we see there's a little bit of an effect of um, the uh, street lighting category. So we've got high pressure sodium, light emitting diode and unlit sites. Uh, we see there's a little bit of a difference in um, from one uh, lighting category to another, but the main difference is really are between the months. So in the UK, as I said, in February, it's especially cold and wet, and in April, it's a bit less cold and wet. So we have a higher biodiversity that have probably come out by April to then be fed on by the spiders. And so we see for these violin plots showing distribution of the number of ASVs consumed by a given spider that more were consumed in April. There's also not really an especially strong pattern there um, using the two different primer pairs. So the ANML primers or the ZBJ primers didn't make too much of a difference to our study there. However, when you look at uh, the species, taxonomic species that we were able to assign as opposed to looking at approximate sequence variants, actually it's still pretty much the same picture, which is quite interesting. So the, num so the main difference is between months. So April, you're getting many more species consumed by spiders than you are in um, February. And actually for um, some of the uh, spiders, in fact, quite a lot, we weren't actually able to assign to species. Many of the um, uh, prey, species, prey sequences that were obtained in February. So to summarize uh, all of that, then yeah, DNA mark metabarcoding lets us look at lots of different ecological interactions and lots of different interaction types. It's a really promising, exciting technology for sort of pushing the boundaries and seeing things within ecology that previously we could only really dream of. And so it gives us much better resolution than uh, was possible using observational techniques, especially with predators such as, say, bats, where all of their um, Feeding typically will be occurring at night, and if they're predators, you can't really di dissect out very much from their feces to look at what they've consumed. So we're getting much better data from metabarcoding than would have been previously the place with um, observational techniques. But um, as some of this talk's hopefully sort of driven home, a lot of it comes with decisions and limitations that you have to be bearing in mind for the methodology. So it's kind of the best data that we've had to, to date really as scientists, but that's not to say it's perfect. There are a lot of things that we need to be thinking about and some of it will be potentially even affecting the conclusions that we're drawing if we're not careful to really interrogate our assumptions within when we're generating our data. So to end, I would just like to thank, I guess, uh, my colleagues who helped me out in the field and my supervisors, Beth and Steve, who were massively important to getting my PhD work sort of planned, undertaken and finished. And then uh, thank the funders. So uh, the PhD work was funded a lot by uh, NERC in the consortium uh, Lombok. And then uh, my work that I'm now doing with Target Malaria, Target Malaria funded by Open Philanthropy and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So thank you very much to them. And thank you for listening.